Good morning, everyone. I know everyone's uh, getting settled and finishing up the breakfast. You can hear the excitement. But I'll go ahead and get started here. Um, my name is Brett McReynolds. I'm the Director of Alliance Development at Horizon Therapeutics. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you all to this year's Rare, Rare Disease Week on Capitol Hill. Uh, can we take a moment to appreciate the fact we're all gathered here in person? I think it's been three years um, since everyone was together. And it's wonderful to meet so many of you, and I met many of you last night at the wonderful documentary screening. Each year, Rare Disease Week brings together rare disease communities from across the country to learn about federal legislative issues, meet other advocates, and share your unique stories with legislators. Um, I'm pleased to be here on behalf of my company, Horizon Therapeutics, which is a global biotechnology company that's dedicated to delivering breakthrough medicines to those living with rare, autoimmune, and severe inflammatory diseases in the U.S. and around the world. As this year's presidential sponsor, Horizon is grateful to all of you for your willingness to engage with policymakers on issues of importance to the rare disease community. We're also so grateful to the Every Life Foundation whose tremendous work on behalf of the community to educate lawmakers and drive policy change on issues of importance continues to shape the future for individuals in the United States. The work you do is so critical in advancing sensible policy solutions and we're so pleased to support these efforts. At Horizon, we're driven by a clear purpose to improve the lives of those living with these often overlooked diseases. Many of us at Horizon know someone, we live with the rare disease ourselves, or we've been deeply moved to action through a loved one's personal story. That's why it's not only work for us. Um, for us, it's personal. This dedication uh, led us to partner with Every Life Foundation in 2020 on the Rarest Scholarship Fund for U.S. adults living with rare disease to pursue educational activities. To date, I know 177 scholarships have been distributed by Every Life. And we're very excited to announce this year, we've doubled our commitment for 70 more scholarships um, for this year. I'm so excited for the future of this program. I wanna thank Every Life Foundation for hosting such important events this week. I also wanna highlight the tremendous job that Julia and Frank did yesterday on the Hills Rare Disease Day event. I hope everyone got to see that. Your leadership here is so vital. Thank you to all the staff who are so tirelessly dedicated to advancing the development of treatment for rare disease patients through science-driven public policy. And finally, I wanna say thank you to each of you for taking the time to come to Washington, D.C. to share your stories and advocate on issues of importance to you, your family, and the rare disease community. You being here matters. Your story matters, your voice matters. Thank you for taking time to share them. Thank you. I'll hand it back to Shannon. Thank you so much, Brett, and thank you to Horizon for their support. I'm Shannon Von Felden. I'm the Senior Director of Advocacy here at the Every Life Foundation. This is my fifth Rare Disease Week on Capitol Hill, and we say every year it just gets better and better, and I think that this year um, that saying goes without saying, um, because we're here in person after three very long years, and we're so excited to have you all here. Um, and get to welcome you here today. Um, I would love to see um, who in the room, um, if this is your first Rare Disease Week on Capitol Hill, um, in person, vir you know, virtually, you've never attended Rare Disease Week. Wow, welcome, we're so excited to have you. And I'd love to see if this is your first in-person Rare Disease Week. You've only advocated virtually and you're here and meeting with your members of Congress in person for the first time. Excellent, welcome. And then for those who are newer to advocacy, I'm sure they'd love to see those who have been to Rare Disease Week before and know the ropes. Who is a veteran of Rare Disease Week here? Perfect. Welcome to all of you. So those are the people um, to ask questions if you have any and to uh, follow around the hill if you need help getting around. Let's see if I can get my slides to work here. 
There we go. Um, again, thank you to all of our Rare Disease Week on Capitol Hill sponsors. Um, with their support, we're able to um, organize Rare Disease Week on Capitol Hill. Um, a lot has changed in the last three years. Uh, we have scheduled over 300 meetings on the Hill tomorrow, and um, over 300 patient organizations are represented this week. Um, so it's a very wide group of people. Um, and today you are going to learn about legislation that impacts the rare disease community and how you can make a difference, especially tomorrow during your meetings. Um, and then you'll meet with your legislators and your staff tomorrow and share your rare disease story and how they can help you and others in the rare disease community. I want to thank Sarita Edwards and Abby Hauser, our advocacy chair and vice chair for Rare Disease Week, for all their support and hard work. And I also want to thank our staff here at the Every Life Foundation for all of their support in organizing this event. And please, when you see these faces around today and tomorrow, please don't hesitate to stop anyone. If you have a question, introduce yourself. We all want to meet you um, and learn more about you. So please don't hesitate to reach out to us. For those who need closed captioning and translation services, we do have wordly translations. So there's a poster in the back with instructions and also little half sheets on your table so that you can um, access those. Um, let's see. And then also, you should have received your program booklet in the tote bag when you registered this morning at the check-in tables. These program booklets have everything you need to know about Rare Disease Week, um, an overview of the events, legislative conference agenda, maps, accessibility resources, a glossary. Um, we tried to think of everything and every question that would be asked. So um, if you have a question, I would look at the booklet, see if it's in there. And if not, don't hesitate to reach out to any of us. Um, but it should be very informative. We have some special resources to make sure everyone is as comfortable as possible today. Um, and these details are in the booklet as well, but I wanna make sure that everyone is aware of them. We have an area for families. Um, it's up the stairs in the Oculus. Um, so if you need to take time away with your kids, um, feel free to utilize that space. Um, there will be a live stream of this room, so you won't miss any of our presentations during that time if you decide to do that. It will be closed from 1.30 to 2.30 because we want to make sure that everyone is in this room during the Preparing for Successful Meetings session. And then we also have a nursing room off of Atrium Ballroom A, which is across the atrium. So if you need... Um, some privacy, you can find it there. We also have a nap nook also across the way off of Atrium Ballroom A. So please feel free to use that if you need a break or you need to rest. We also have an on-site nurse, I believe, in the room over that way. So if anyone needs any help or assistance, please feel free um, to visit that room for the on-site nurse. Uh, we also have a virtual photo booth, so please, um, you can download it using the QR code, take a selfie, and post about your experiences here at Rare Disease Week. We would love to uh, see those and hear more about um, your experiences this week. And then we have a social media lounge. There's actually a schedule on a page dedicated to the social media lounge in your program booklet. Um, so check that out. They're looking for stories from patients and family members. Um, and so we would love uh, your participation in that effort. And then, of course, we have drinks all day long um, behind you um, in, the, in this room. So please feel free um, to get whatever you need. We also have um, a phone charging station. You might have seen that. Um, it's actually out this room and to the right. So if you need to charge your phone, please um, don't hesitate to use those. And then if anyone needs um, a little extra social distancing space, um, we have in the ballroom A across the atrium a room 
that has the live stream from this room. So if anyone needs to take a break or wants a little bit extra space for social distancing, please don't hesitate to use that room. And then of course, just a reminder of our remaining events. After the legislative conference at 445, um, our young adults are more than welcome to join um, us for the young adult meetup at 7 p.m. And then online at 6 p.m., we have our Yard Leadership Academy graduation, and you can access that online through the attendee corner. And tomorrow, we're going to start at 9 o'clock in the morning for the Rare Disease Caucus Briefing on, in the Senate Office Building. So please feel free to join us there. Leave plenty of time for security um, to get into the building. You can also... Um, if you have a meeting scheduled, just make sure you know when your meetings are and leave yourself plenty of time to get to your Hill meetings. Uh, the Hill meetings are scheduled from 10 to 5. There are some that are maybe um, in that 9 o'clock hour, so just keep an eye on your schedules. We're going to have our group picture on the Capitol steps. You've probably seen the picture in our marketing materials at 4.30 p.m. So anyone who doesn't have a meeting at that time, please join us on the Capitol steps, and we'll take that group photo tomorrow. And then our rare artist reception is from 5 to 7 p.m. And we'll be showcasing some amazing artwork from our rare artist awardees. And then I have two announcements I wanted to make today. So last year we launched the Rare Advocacy Learning Program during Rare Disease Week. And we are planning another round of Rare Advocacy Learning this spring. It's going to be a six-week seminar again um, and help advocates with prior advocacy experience take their advocacy journey to the next level. The application is open today and will close on April 1st. This spring, we're going to focus on federal advocacy and, um, and focus on rare disease policy, policy issues that affect the rare disease community and opportunities to successfully engage as advocates at the federal level. Um, and you can learn more at everylifefoundation.org backslash rare dash advocates. And then secondly, um, new this year, we are offering a brand new mentorship program for those looking for one-on-one -on -one advocacy guidance and support. We have recruited 10 amazing, well-versed advocates who have served in leadership position roles and have experience with building relationships with legislatures and can help their mentees identify and strengthen their advocacy goals. So if this is something that you are interested in participating in as a mentee, the application is open as well. It can be found at the link at the bottom of the screen. And if you have any questions about either of those, please don't hesitate to reach out to myself or Lindsay Cundiff. And now, I know that was a lot of information to give you, um, but now I get the pleasure of introducing Sarita Edwards, um, our Rare Disease Week Advocacy Chair. Many of you already know Sarita. If you don't, I highly recommend you saying hi and introducing yourself. Sarita is a member of the RDLA Advisory Committee and her passion for advocacy and dedication to the rare disease community comes through in all that she does. Uh, Sarita is the CEO and president at the EWE Foundation, a healthcare advocacy organization that supports families with Edwards syndrome and other rare diseases. Sarita's son, Elijah, was diagnosed in utero, utero with full trisomy 18, which began her efforts in advocacy and public policy. Please join me in welcoming Sarita to the stage. Good morning. Oh, no. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We are excited to be here this week with all of you. Thank you so much to Shannon for that introduction. Um, thank you to all of the sponsors who supported Every Life Foundation and RDLA in making this event possible. Um, for those of us to be here in person and to those who are able to join tune in uh, via the virtual live stream. Um, thank you to all of you, the rare advocates who have decided to be here in person in DC. Welcome. Um, clicker. 
All right, let's see. There we go. So back in 2016, my husband Kareem and I learned that we were pregnant with our fifth child. Um, around 22 weeks, we were told that our unborn child had a rare disease named Edwards syndrome, commonly known as trisomy 18. We were told that he would pass away in utero during the delivery process or shortly after birth. In March of 2017, Elijah was born alive, but we were told repeatedly to enjoy our time with him because he would probably die soon. I remember my husband having to ask the delivery room nurses to clean the birth off of Elijah. I had, oh, I had to ask them for infant formula because Elijah couldn't latch on to nurse. The nurses looked at each other and whispered, she wants to feed him. I did. We were told we didn't need newborn screening, nor did they give it to us, nor would they confirm his diagnosis. They told us that Elijah looked consistent with everything we had already been told prenatally. We were sent home post-delivery in hospice care where Elijah stayed for seven months of his life with oxygen that we never needed and with morphine that we never used. In March of 2019, we started the Ewe Foundation. Sorry. We started the Ewe Foundation, the Elijah Wayne Edwards Foundation. Like many of you, we experienced gaps in receiving our rare diagnosis and how the healthcare system chose to respond. No one shared resources with us. We were told to find a support group without any direction or assistance on how to do that. As a patient advocacy organization, we want to change the narrative about trisomy 18 and keep other families, families like ours, from having experiences like ours. With three core programs, LEAP, Zebra, and Stripe, we offer trisomy 18 and other, other rare diseases uh, families with health literacy, community education, comfort care, mental health, end of life solutions, and economic assistance for our trisomy 18 families who may be experiencing financial hardship. 2019 was also my first RDLA event, Rare Across America. Elijah had a total of five surgeries before his second birthday. Today, Elijah is in kindergarten. Yes, Elijah is in kindergarten. He is six years old. He will be six years old on March 28th. He has a list of medical complexities. We see about 19 specialists, but Elijah is alive. You are here today because you yourself or someone you love has a rare condition. You're waiting to be diagnosed with a rare condition or someone near to you, dear to you, has passed away because of a rare condition. You know the isolation, the exhaustion, the frustration that comes with having a rare disease. In this room today, we are patients, we are parents, we're caregivers, we're friends, we're nonprofit leaders, we're educators, we're researchers, we're scientists, and in addition to all of that, we are rare advocates. You are here today because the healthcare system, insurance providers, employers, institutions, school systems, none of them have quite figured out how to accommodate us, how to serve us, how to treat us, how to support us. They need guidance and instruction that we can give, not from outsiders who've heard us tell our stories, but they need to hear it from us, those of us who are living and breathing rare disease every single day. You are here today because your voice might get silenced when you speak it by yourself. But when we come together as a collective group, as a united voice, we can not only spark change, but we can burn down systems that no longer serve us. As rare advocates, 
We want to accelerate diagnoses and treatment solutions, not because we're impatient, but because the luxury of time don't exist for all of us. We want an appropriation strategy because we know firsthand about the financial burden of living with a rare disease. We want regulatory compliance because being a rare patient doesn't quite fit the standard of care model for the generalized population. For those of us in this room today, rare disease is not just a passion that moves us to advocacy. It's about creating better health outcomes for patients and families in the rare disease space. For us in this room today, this is about survival. This is about quality of life. This is about living to see another day. Thank you so much for being here. We are excited to celebrate Rare Disease Week 2023 in person. Thank you. Thank you. Y'all are awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate you. Um, now we will go into our legislative outlook and 2023 legislative ask. I will call to the Steve, uh, Stephen Munir from Sanofi. Thank you so much. Wow, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Steve Munier. I'm the head of uh, public affairs and patient advocacy at Santa Fe. And I have the pleasure of introducing the first panel today. Um, and I had a few remarks written, but after that, I feel like I just need to reflect for a moment. <laughs> um, and just say, you know, that is what this is all about. Like Elijah, we're all born into a world with a healthcare system already designed not by us, by a political system and a policy system not designed by us, and this is an opportunity to make that better. It is an e unequal system, it is a complicated system, and if your healthcare track is off the normal track, you often get lost in the woods. So this is our opportunity to do that. So thank you for everyone for being here. Um, <clears throat> so I've been in industry for about 10 years, and prior to that I was a Senate staffer. So I used to be the person on the other side of the table that you're gonna meet with tomorrow. And let me just say, I love Hill Days, they love Hill Days, they want to hear your story. This is an intimidating process. They're intimidating buildings, the rooms are intimidating. It's like walking around a museum and sometimes it can be flustering. And, you know, I think they're going to do everything they can today with this panel to untangle some of the tangledness of Capitol Hill. But let me just remind you, and you're going to hear this over and over again, the folks you're going to talk to tomorrow, this is their job. You will be their best meeting of the day, their best meeting of the week. So take that time. It is your time and embrace that and really tell your stories. I, I can tell you it, it makes all the difference in the world. Uh, so with that, I want to introduce and welcome up today's panel uh, that will help sort of guide through what's going on on the Hill and where uh, you can have an impact on that. Uh, and we have a great panel today, I think a lot of different perspectives. Uh, so I'm going to introduce uh, Nicholas Minetto, who is a principal at Fager Drinker, where he leads successful healthcare policy advocacy campaigns. He represents a wide variety of clients with an emphasis on patient advocacy organizations and children's hospitals. Next, I'm going to introduce Jamie Sullivan, who I'm sure many of you know. Jamie is a senior director of policy at the Every Life Foundation. Uh, Jamie previously spent 15 years with the Alpha One and COPD foundations focusing on achieving patient-centered policy changes in the areas of appropriations, health, uh, public health, and access to care. Welcome, Jamie. Next is Chris Jones. Chris is a senior policy advisor for Representative Gus Bilirakis. Uh, Chris received his BA and master's from the George Mason University, where he studied economics and public policy. And Chris has worked with the congressman uh, since uh, 2015, where he worked his way up from an intern to senior legislative staff. Welcome, Chris. Next, we have Dylan Simon. Uh, Dylan works as the Director of Policy at the Every Life Foundation. Uh, Dylan's focus is on newborn screening, which we just heard is an incredibly important area, as well as diagnostic policy issues and annual appropriation efforts for the rare disease community. Uh, Dave Zook. Dave is, has over three decade uh, record of achieving federal policy, regulatory, and financing goals 
with a wide variety of clients. He moved to Washington after law school to work for three members of Congress in the U.S. House Appropriations Committee. Today, he's a partner at the global law firm of Fager Drinker and leads its government and regulatory affairs group. And lastly, Jackie. Um, Jackie is a health policy advisor to Congresswoman Matsui, who represents the 7th District of California, which is the Sacramento area. She re received her master's in public health, focusing on health policy from the George Washington University. Uh, and welcome, Jackie. So with that, I'm going to hand it off to the uh, very, very capable uh, panel here. And thank you all for your time, and good luck tomorrow. Thank you very much. There we go. Well, great to be back here in person. And uh, before I kick things off, I just want to thank all of you for taking the time to come here, to come back to Washington. Just so critically important that you're doing this to develop new, strengthen additional existing relationships with key members of Congress. And it's just great to see this room full again. So I'll talk to you a bit this morning, just giving you a little brief overview of the landscape that you're going to be navigating. And I always like to start with a picture or two. And I would say, you know, it's been an interesting start to the 118th Congress. I think regardless of where you sit on the political spectrum, uh, we had a, uh, a, an interesting couple months or an interesting start to the year. A few of the uh, images that we have from those sort of when C-SPAN was must-see TV, the highest rankings ever, and uh, freed and liberated from the sort of stad shots that they usually have, and uh, a lot of interesting moments there during that first week of January. Now, here we are two months in on March 1st, and I think, you know, one of the, you know, interesting thoughts that come to my mind is that, you know, it's been a slower start to this Congress for a few reasons. Um, the, the speaker election that played out in January and then some other delays over on the Senate side. You know, there's been a little bit of a cascading impact here where you've had some delays and some of the other uh, typical business of reorganizing the Congress that happens usually pretty early on. We, with some of those delays and sort of getting chamber rules up and going and then getting committees constituted and then finding out, you know, officially who's going to lead a committee and then populating the members of the committee and then getting the subcommittees filled out and getting your official meetings and getting staff hired or rehired. That took a little bit more time in both chambers, again, for slightly different reasons over on the Senate side. But you've seen this little, I would say, in the time I've been here in Washington, a bit of a delay to what we would typically see in this cycle with regard to getting um, Congress more fully up and running and, and going. So you know, that was just a, a thought that comes to my mind of what we've seen over the past two months is now, as we head into this uh, you know, March month of March and you being on the Hill, something to keep in mind that you may encounter or may be reflected in some of your conversations um, tomorrow or on, yeah, Thursday on the Hill. And just, you know, I don't I know many of you follow this incredibly closely. So unless anyone's been hibernating for the past couple months, you know, I don't need to um, remind folks about how narrowly divided the government is. But just a few numbers here for you to keep in mind. We have the Senate, which is sort of this 51-49 split, rep Democrat to Republican, although, you know, technically that's even a little different because you have really a 48-49-3 because three of those Senate offices who typically caucus with the Democrats are uh, typically, technically independent, but for many intents and purposes, they are um, aligned. So it's a, you know, ostensibly a 51-49 margin in the Senate. And then in the House, you know, we have this 222 to 213. We're officially up to the full complement of 435 members following a special election last week in Virginia. And that is a very narrow majority, as we saw play out uh, in the early weeks of Jan days of January. So just that's something also to keep in mind, that we have have not just a divided government, but a very narrowly divided government, which will be informing a lot of what plays out this year. And then, of course, the other factor out there um, that we're all well aware of is that we are speeding toward, or many of us could actually say we're well in the middle of a, a national election cycle. It doesn't seem like we have the gaps that we used to have back in the day, where you have at least a little pause from one cycle to another. But um, with 2024 looming uh, ahead, that is also another item to keep in mind that will be uh, influencing how things play out this year uh, in Washington. So, you know, what does this all mean? So when you have a narrowly divided government, I think there's really two outcomes that could come about. You could either have some compromise on some key issues or you can have gridlock. And, you know, the very narrow division here and this attention on 2024 uh, probably means that we'll see a limited period of legislating at least during this, uh, this year and this time period. 
Um, and I think this has also been recognized in, in Congress. You know, when you look at some of the activity that played out late last year, um, some items that had to be uh, extended or continued, you know, there was a, uh, they didn't set the end of 2024 by accident when it came to setting a date for, uh, for expirations for many programs going forward. I think there is an expectation uh, by and large that a lot of activity will be rolled until post-election and probably another very big lame duck session uh, to play out in November and December of 2024. But I, you know, a few things then to, just to keep in mind as you go out here, um, you know, not, not just as we look ahead, but also look behind, is that there was a lot of activity that did play out, in particular in the healthcare space uh, at the end of last Congress, particularly the last six months of last year. And I put here just a couple of the items on this screen, not to go into an incredible amount of detail, but we do need to realize that there was a lot of legislating in healthcare, um, the Inflation Reduction Act with its items on um, Medicare drug negotiation and related items there, the premiums for the uh, ACA for the insurance subsidies, the Safer Communities Act, this was the bill that was enacted after the um, Uvalde tragedy in Texas that had a lot of mental health health provisions. And then even just at the end of December, we had a lot of activity here um, with extending or um, refining some existing programs. You know, telehealth flexibilities were a big one, extending the CHIP program, the Children's Health Insurance program for their two years, more graduate medical education slots, um, improving our ability to respond to any future pandemics. That all got signed into law in the very end of December. So, you know, thinking about that, it was a lot of activity in healthcare and other play, other sectors that played out at the very end of the year. And I'm thinking a bit about like when you, you know, you have the snake that ate the big rabbit and now it's got to digest all that. And we're going through that process now, or the federal agencies now need to, in a way, digest all that, all these new laws, and do a lot of rulemaking and regulating to implement some of them. So, you know, that as well as the activity and the pacing in Congress, just wanted to make sure that was on your on your horizon, on your on your mind as you go into these meetings, just to have a sense of what has happened in the recent past here with regard to healthcare legislation. And then looking at the calendar, we really have, I think, a critical, you know, four or five months here between now and the anticipated August congressional recess, um, where maybe we'll see some opportunity to move into some legislative activity. We know that there's a big looming issue around um, debt and borrowing that's sort of, I think, informing a lot of the larger agenda. Um, and that's, that's the reality. It is, it is what it is. And then, you know, once summer turns to fall and kids are back to school and buses are taken up the roads again, um, you know, we'll increasingly see movement toward the national elections. And then in the fall and early winter, that will become even more so, especially as we head toward um, the all inter always interesting uh, primary calendar and caucus calendar in early 2024. So um, there is this kind of critical window really right now when you're in town through the early summer uh, for, I think, where, where Congress could perhaps have some time and energy focused on some of these key issues before we see a lot of diversion. And then just looking at you know the healthcare landscape, there are a lot of issues on the landscape. This is not at all an uh, exhaustive list here, but just to give a few you know highlights here of topics that you are probably hearing or seeing or reading about, or that you may hear people talking about, you know, this uh, transition out of our, you know, three years now, this public health emergency, uh, given the coronavirus pandemic, you know, this this now, this movement forward from emergency status to sort of back to pre-COVID, that's, that's going to take a lot of um, activity on the executive branch end, but also it's going to lead to probably a lot of congressional activity and oversight and a lot of interest there because the designation will impact many, many areas um, that in some cases have been taken for granted for the past three years when, when things will no longer uh, be what we've been doing for, for several years now. So that's a big issue. Implementation of the Inflation Reduction Act, which I mentioned or referred to earlier, sort of as the federal agencies uh, issue a lot of rulemaking and regulating in this to implement that, that, that law, especially the drug provisions. A lot of oversight, especially with the, tr the flipping of the balance of power over in the House with, from Democrat to Republican. Uh, there are a number of issues on the radar, including you know, the COVID response, the 340B, which is a drug discount program. On the Democratic side, Medicare Advantage, some, some questions about Medicare Advantage and pharmacy benefit manager. There are a lot of items that various members want to scrutinize a bit, and that will be taking up a lot of the committee's time. Ongoing issues, interest around telehealth flexibilities and what sort of the new norm looks like as we move from a pandemic stage to post-pandemic. 
continued issue, interest in the mental and behavioral health crises and also substance use disorders. That's again, continues to be a big issue in communities across the country. And of course, we've seen this discussion on entitlements, you know, and, and what does that look like? What does that mean near term versus more longer term, you know, around Medicare, Medicaid and Social Security? You know, will there be anything more there or will it just be sort of a largely a campaign oriented messaging? So there are a lot of issues. Again, there are many others that you could add to this list, but just wanted to give you a little sense of some of the, the top ones that are resonating. And then just to keep in mind too, as you again go prepare for your Hill days tomorrow, um, new Congress means some new faces or familiar faces now in new roles. And we saw a lot of changes, at least on some of the key health oriented committees. And um, I'm not gonna speak to each of these, but really just flashing here, you know, the Senate Co Finance Committee is still pretty consistent from the chair and uh, top Republican from the last cycle. And some of the issues here remain consistent with mental and behavioral health, um, the IRA and its implementation on the drug side, access to therapies, PBMs, Medicare Advantage, and these are the committee, this is a committee that deals primarily with the, the Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security and tax component of health care. Over on the Senate Help Committee, a big change here with a new chair and a new ranking member. So Chairman Bernie Sanders and ranking member Dr. Bill Cassidy. Um, drug pricing, affordability, the workforce, the healthcare workforce, access to care, all big areas of interest, particularly to, to Chairman Sanders. Um, and that's again a committee that's had a sizable leadership change. Over on the House where, you know, the committees are, are panelists where their bosses are both on. You know, we've had a flip, uh, the, basically a flipping of hats from Kathy Mark Morris Rogers becoming the chair and Frank Pallone being the ranking member. And over on the um, House Ways and Means Committee, we have a new chairman on the Republican side, Jason Smith from Missouri, and then uh, still ranking member Richie Neal from Massachusetts. These are key committees for you to uh, become familiar with depending on your uh, respective agendas. And then the other ones to keep in mind will be the appropriations committees, which as you know, fund the government and help influence spending policy. So just a few final thoughts from my end as you prepare for tomorrow. You know, I think it's very important to um, not get discouraged or frustrated. It can be easy to do that at times if you think, well, not much is happening or not much is going to get done. Really important for you to continue to engage. The fact that you're all here, of course, says that you clearly are. You've got that message already. You're not giving up. You're not backing away. Um, it's very tempting to sometimes want to say, hey, we'll come back in two years when things are neat and orderly, but you know, that really doesn't happen, right? And in that time period, um, other interests will come in to fill the gap. So the most important thing in my view is not to give up, go away, but to really work your, work, your, work your issue, have some realistic goals and objectives, um, look at what you can get done, be realistic, look at all the many tools in the public policy and advocacy toolbox and look, think about other ways, you know, if maybe that significant piece of legislation that you want maybe won't get enacted this year, but are there ways to try and um, you know, push for funding provisions or direction from Congress to key agencies and departments, um, work on rulemaking and regulating, work with Congress to influence agency activities? There's a lot that you can do even while working toward that larger end goal. And I think a lot you know, can be achieved even during this period where it may be um, a window of some le limited legislating at least in this um, near to mid term. So continue to think broadly and holistically about what you can do. And I think you know, most importantly, thinking about the unifying power of the rare disease community going back, you know, we just recently celebrated, as you know, the 40th anniversary of the Orphan Drug Act. You know, there's um, thinking about Henry Waxman and Orrin Hatch, those were members who were on uh, very different ends of the political spectrum on many votes and many issues, but they came together um, on orphan and rare disease. And I think, you know, over the four decades since, we've seen that commonality continue where members, rare diseases has brought together members from, in many cases, very different ends, opposite ends of the political spectrum, but they've seen the ability to come together to unite uh, behind these important causes. So think through that, make sure that's on your mind as you're up there tomorrow and uh, wish you all the best in your meetings. <clears throat> Okay. Hi, everyone. Well, I'm going to talk just for a couple minutes, uh, switch gears and talk a little bit about rare disease statistics and where we're at. As I'm sure many of you have noticed, we are, um, often have very conflicting statistics out there. So as you've prepared for your meetings, as you've um, participated in Rare Disease Day events yesterday, you may have likely noticed that there's 
6,000 rare diseases, but there's 7,000 rare diseases, but there's 10,000 rare diseases. So there's 90% of rare diseases that have no treatments, or 95. And so when you look across communications, uh, across organizations, different agencies, you see very different numbers. And that can often lead to confusion. Uh, confusion among you as advocates, among the research community, among our federal partners, and in Congress. And so what we have been working on uh, as, as a rare disease community of organizations is an effort to really look and dive into the literature, the state of our statistics, and try and come to consensus so that we can carry one message forward. And th that transition will happen slowly. But what I wanted to do today is give you a little bit of an update. And why we think that these are likely the, the consensus statistics that we are going to land on for now. Statistics are never static, meaning this is going to change inevitably, and different organizations have different considerations for how quickly they can change the numbers that they use. So I will say with caution that you, know, you won't see overnight everyone coming together and harmonizing our statistics. So we'll continue to have a little bit of discrepancy across sources and, and that's, you know, that's okay. But what we wanted to do for advocacy purposes was all come together with other rare disease organizations and come up with a consensus statement that says based on the best available knowledge that we have today, this is what we think the science tells us, the literature tells us, uh, is the impact of rare disease. So a couple other points, you'll notice that these, this is just a small fraction of the statistics that are out there and that you use in your advocacy. We had to start with the most commonly, um, common used statistics, but also those that there, where there is the most discrepancy across sources. We are working together um, and working with the scientific community to come up with a final consensus statement. So there's a chance that these are slightly modified in the wording, uh, but that by and large, these statistics are based in literature and we feel very confident in using them and suggest that you use them tomorrow when you go out to the hill. So first, it has become um, fairly clear that there are more than 10,000 identified rare diseases. Uh, that is based on two published papers, as well as uh, the um, understanding of the NCATS team. And you'll hear a little bit more about NCATS uh, throughout the day. That's the institute at NIH that largely focuses on rare diseases. And so you have heard, uh, starting yesterday, uh, and in some uh, published commentary from the NIH, them start to use that 10,000 number. And so that's why uh, we feel pretty comfortable saying uh, to all of you to go in the, to the Hill tomorrow using that 10,000 number. Uh, we also have been working to look at those approved FDA treatments. And you, there are approximately uh, just over around 1,100 orphan designated approvals in the FDA database. However, it's tempting to just kind of do math and, and come up with a percentage uh, based on how many diseases. We can't do that because we know that there are more than one, uh, there's more than one approval per disease area. So we are, we have done a bit more of a deep dive. We're in the process of that so that when we put it out, we can have a scientific citation, but feel also very comfortable saying that there are fewer than 5% of those 10,000 rare diseases that have an FDA approved treatment specifically for that disease. And then lastly, we've had a, a lot of great research published, uh, starting with the Everlife Foundation's National Economic uh, Impact of Rare Disease Study, uh, followed by an NIH study, um, and a GAO report, and uh, a couple others that have really shed light on the cost of rare diseases. And all of those studies study, assess what was quantifiable in the cost of rare disease. And nearly all of them came in right around a trillion dollars. And that is an estimate that doesn't even capture the full scope of rare diseases. So we feel very confident saying that rare diseases cost over one trillion dollars annually in the US. Lastly, when you dive into that data, you'll see that there, that data covers indirect, direct, and non-medical expenses. Direct expenses are those very quantifiable healthcare expenses, claims data that's used to identify what are we paying for healthcare services. 
indirect includes things like lost productivity, forced retirement, um, and absenteeism, and things that, that are harder to quantify but are quantifiable. And then non-medical expenses come from all of those expenses that you all face just that aren't covered by insurance, that deal with home modifications, educational support, um, uncovered treatment costs. Uh, so combined, all of those expenses are over $1 trillion. So we hope that this helps briefly clarify three of those expenses. We know that more is coming. This is just a small fraction of the statistics that we need to dive into, and we look forward to getting there together with the community and to releasing the first part of this consensus statement very soon, uh, but encourage you to go ahead and use these statistics when you're out on the Hill tomorrow. And I look forward to answering questions if you have them after the panel. <clears throat> Thank you, Jamie. So just to put this, frame this for you all, so now we're gonna jump to the four suggested legislative asks for Rare Disease Week for your Hill meetings tomorrow. RDLA has prepared four different asks. If you've been on our webinars, you have heard a little bit about them, but Chris, Dylan, Jackie, and Dave are here to give you some highlights and overviews of those asks so that you can start thinking about which asks you might wanna make during your meetings. Um, and then we'll have a Q&A um, after, so that you can ask any burning questions you might have for them. Chris, are you first to go? Excellent. I'll just stay here. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thanks so much for having me. Um, and thank you to the Every Life Foundation for, for hosting this. And uh, my name is Chris Jones. I work for Congressman Gus Bilirakis. He serves as uh, one of the co-chairs of the Rare Disease Caucus. He serves uh, Florida's 12th Congressional District, and he serves on the Energy and Commerce Committee and the Health Subcommittee. Um, it's, it's always uh, been a priority for the congressman as long as I've been with him. I've been with him for, for seven years now um, to, to focus on accelerating the development of rare disease research in particular. Um, and to do that, uh, we've had a number of different ideas, uh, legislative ideas, um, a number of, of different uh, ideas that we've kind of put forward um, to help accelerate um, and make rare disease research and particularly the development of treatments and cures um, move faster and more efficiently. Um, the, by way of background, the, the way that this looked in the past couple of years uh, for you all has been the Speeding Therapy Access Today Act, the STAT Act, um, which was uh, legislation that was uh, authored by uh, Congressman Bilirakis and, and the, the four co-chairs of the caucus at the time. Um, and we, we really made a, a pretty strong concerted effort uh, to push that into uh, the, the FDA user fee package um, last, last Congress. Um, and in that process, we, we received a legislative hearing um, and, and we're receiving some fairly positive feedback uh, from the committees uh, within the Congress um, and uh, typically would, you know, we always uh, try to at least involve the agencies that we are authorizing, known as, um, in this case, the FDA, uh, for technical assistance and feedback. Uh, we got that feedback and, and the, the feedback was certainly, um, for lack of a better term, uh, challenging to work with. Uh, they, they basically, uh, came back to us and said, hey, we, uh, we think that we are already accomplishing the goals um, you know, laid out in the STAT Act. And what the STAT Act was, was focused on was establishing a, an inner center of excellence to coordinate across the centers because we've heard time and again from, from patient advocates, from you all, from um, uh, companies that we've worked with who are, are trying to get their treatments to market. They know that they're, um, that they're safe uh, that there's efficacy there, um, and they're just coming across roadblocks. Uh, so that was certainly uh, disappointing to hear, and, and, but you know, we wanted to continue to try to work on, um, on that particular policy of, of uh, improving coordination, uh, improving consistency across the centers at the FDA, 
uh, I've, I've heard from, from a company that was, um, has gone through four different review divisions, all for the same product, which just seems to be like they're bouncing around within the agency. Um, that's not necessarily, that's certainly an extreme example, but it's, it's uh, cons we've heard consistently that there's inconsistencies. So um, rather than try to, uh, given that we were not able to enact the, the STAT Act, unfortunately, but uh, the four co-chairs got together, this, this Congress, and, and decided, well, rather than um, just throwing the legislation up again, um, we, we think that may not be the most uh, effective way to engage with the, with the agency here. Uh, I think w we figured that it would be better to try to uh, allow the FDA, and one of their biggest concerns was structural. It was an infrastructure. We have the infrastructure already in place to do this. This is a duplicative if we did a center of excellence. Was, they, they kind of viewed it as duplicative. So um, that is really what the impetus for this letter is, um, that we are taking just as seriously as, as we were uh, with the legislation, the STAT Act. Um, and, and what the letter does is it asks the FDA to use the existing infrastructure to accomplish the goals that were previously outlined in that legislation, namely to improve coordination, to improve um, access, to look at the way that they um, review uh, rare disease uh, treatment applications um, and, and do a better job of, of applying that consistency uh, consistently across the centers um, and across all of their review divisions. Uh, so what we do is we ask the FDA to create uh, a, an agency task force, which we would you know, view as, as uh, something that the FDA has done before, um, and specifically reviewed rare disease therapy and product applications within that task force. Um, so rather than creating a new in a center of excellence, which I still think is a good idea. Um, uh, let, let's try to meet them in the middle and, and um, give them an opportunity to respond. And, and we, we list out that while we appreciate all the progress that's been made, we, we understand that you know, it's been 40 years of, of, uh, of progress, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done here and there's a lot of challenges that we're seeing and that we're hearing from, from you all, from uh, the industry who are trying to get rare disease treatments and therapies um, to, to patients and are just unable to do that because of bureaucratic hurdles, uh, which should be, and process issues, which uh, should not be the case. Of all the things, it, I understand if there's scientific concerns or you know, medical um, efficacy, that, that, that's what clinical trials are for, right? Um, but when you're coming across um, various reviewers that treat, you know, rare diseases as if they're one-off issues, that's a big problem. Um, and so this letter comes with a, a, essentially a laundry list of, of things that we would like uh, the FDA to specifically do um, and report to, to the public and to Congress um, uh, by the end of this Congress, um, which is a, more than enough time, we, we think, to produce a report on rare disease uh, review, um, application review, and, and the inconsistencies that we're seeing across, across the centers. Uh, so uh, among those are, are areas of, you know, identifying. First, let's, let, let's let them um, so do a self-examination here. Uh, let's identify the areas of strengths, but also the areas of, of potential discordance. Uh, let's offer specific re recommendations to, um, you know, to promote policies uh, that are consistent with all, across the, the centers that will strengthen the agency's commitment to rare disease. Um, provide tracking metrics. Uh, review the implementation of the accelerated approval pathway, which we know is particularly useful for rare disease, uh, the rare disease community. Uh, review gaps in, in, in guidance specific to small and ultra rare populations um, and offer recommendations for how the agency can address those challenges because those, you know, there, there are challenges with rare compared to non-rare and then there are challenges with ultra-rare even compared to rare. Um, and I, 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 don't, I don't believe and I don't, my, the congressman doesn't believe that 
um, that the agency has recognized that enough. And so we want them to do that um, in a formal setting, uh, to convene a task force, convene the leaders that it wants to convene that it thinks is appropriate. Um, but to be clear that we, we are, uh, we're not satisfied with the status quo um, and, and we want additional uh, coordination and consistency across across the FDA. So that's the letter, the, the four co-chairs, it's bipartisan, bicameral, um, so it's uh, Congressman uh, Bilirakis and Matsui and then Senator Klobuchar and Wicker and uh, the four of us have, have agreed to, to the language in this letter and, and really would love to have all of the, the members of, of uh, the Rare Disease Caucus uh, but also, you know, members who are not on the Rare Disease Caucus too. Any, anyone who is interested in, in this uh, particular policy, uh, we would love to have them join on to the letter. I think it would be a really strong showing uh, to have a, you know, a long list of, of members who are supportive of this. So really appreciate you all going out to your congressional offices, uh, to your members, um, and asking this, uh, asking your member to sign on. Uh, we think that it will accomplish a lot of the, the same things that we were looking at in the past you know, couple of years here. Um, but we'll do so in a way that you know, we're, we're gonna give the FDA a chance you know, to, to uh, provide their approach. Um, and we do, you know, we, as the legislative branch, we do have you know, legislation as, as a backstop here. So uh, that's not out of the question if, if they come back with an, an insufficient response, but um, it, it, we'll give them an opportunity to try and we do wanna work with them to, to, to improve their agency. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Dylan Simon, and first and foremost, thank you all for joining us here today. Uh, we're really excited to have Rare Disease Week back in person and to see everyone. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit today about appropriations. Uh, and so appropriations is a unique opportunity to help guide the way that the government is, government and specific agencies are spending their money and what they're prioritizing. Uh, and so it does provide a yearly opportunity to go in front of your uh, representatives and your senators and say, here's how I hope the money is going to be spent. Here is where I hope your priorities are. Uh, and this is such a unique opportunity because, again, it is annual. Uh, Nick highlighted at the beginning some of the potential challenges uh, with, this, with this upcoming session. But we know that a budget has to get passed every year. Uh, and so this provides an opportunity to to go to, the, to go to Congress to tell the agencies, here's where we want your money to be spent. Here's where we want your priorities to be. Uh, and so we're really excited, again, to have uh, multiple appropriations asked. Uh, and again, we'll go into this uh, in a deeper dive in one of our later sessions, but want to talk a little bit about what those asks are and, and why we are including those as our ask. And so we really have three. Uh, I like to think of it as two, though, because two are very, very much connected. Uh, and so that first one, which has it connected, is increasing funding for rare disease research. Uh, and the ability to increase funding for rare disease research across uh, multiple agencies helps to, these investments benefit all rare diseases. We, we know that to get to those therapies, you have to have some of that basic science research to start. Uh, in addition, uh, some of these programs help to fund clinical trials, uh, and which we know are so impactful. So across the board at both FDA uh, as well as NCATS, which I'll talk about momentarily, these funding programs really help to incentivize rare disease research and really put more funding into these programs that can go back out into the rare disease community and help to develop those therapies that so many within the rare disease community needs. Uh, so within that, again, we, we have two asks. Uh, one is for, the, within the FDA, there is something known as the Orphan Products Grants Program. Um, and this provides unique opportunity to FDA to directly fund research that will help in terms of the clinical trial process. And so, again, we'll do a much deeper dive on these programs uh, in a later session. Uh, but what the FDA programs do, it, it helps to generate funding that will go into natural history studies as well as clinical trials, which are such a critical part of that therapy development. And by increasing the funding through these, through these programs and, and meeting the fully authorized levels, which were just passed in last year's omnibus, and so we know that that number is at 30 million, uh, which we were really excited to see. And so we know, we want to see that number fully funded and to see that money come back into the rare disease community. Uh, in addition, uh, this, the second part of the rare disease research ask is to have a 5% increase uh, for NCATS, uh, which is the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences. Um, and the reason 5% is that is in line with the general NIH uh, increase that is 
across the community to see a 5% increase to NIH. And we just want to make sure that we're seeing that increase go to NCATS uh, as well. And the reason we talk specifically about NCATS as opposed to the NIH as a whole is because NCATS is really the center of rare disease research at the NIH. Uh, so they did recently move their Office of Rare Disease into a division, uh, which uh, gives a little more um, a little more importance, which is always great to see them uh, increasing the, the priority of rare disease research at NCATS. And, and so much of rare disease research does occur across all the institutes at NIH, but NCATS really serves as that hub, uh, really as a centering point in which other institutes at the NIH can come to them, work with them, and help to guide what their rare disease research will be, as well as create a way for these other institutes to work together and create that collaborative approach. And so NCATS really is a great place at the NIH for all the rare disease research to come together, bring that expertise together. We've talked a lot about the FDA in terms of making sure that the expertise is being shared across agencies. NCATS really serves that role within the NIH to ensure the fact that the expertise that is at different institutes within NIH come together under one umbrella and say, okay, let's, here's how we can move this forward uh, in, in a variety of research purposes. And so you'll hear more about that. Uh, we have a couple great speakers from FDA and NIH who will come. Uh, and speak about those programs later today. So I'll let them give a little bit deeper dive on some of the great research that they're doing. Uh, but we're really excited to support those programs and to, to try to support increased funding for them. Uh, and then the last uh, appropriation to ask will surround uh, ultra rare. Um, and so the Orphan Drug Act, uh, we are celebrating its 40th anniversary, as many are aware, uh, has been hugely impactful on the rare disease community, helping to increase the amount of rare disease therapies within the community. Uh, and we know that the incentives within the ODA ha has played such a large role uh, in that process. We also know that small populations and ultra-rare populations have still had a challenge in developing new therapies uh, for their communities. And so we want to start having that conversation of what are the incentives needed to help these small populations, to help ultra-rare communities receive the therapies that they, they need as well. Uh, and so to do that, we, we want to start with what is an ultra-rare disease? And so there has been a lot of conversations on how to best define that. Should we be defining it? That is a, a, always a, that first quick follow-up question around defining ultra-rare is does it need a definition? Uh, and so what the appropriations request will do is we'll ask the National Academy of Sciences to initiate a, a public workshop that will result in a report that will look at how do, should we go about defining ultra-rare? It is not going to ask them to come out with a set number. It's not going to ask them to come out with a set of characteristics. What it's going to ask them to do is say, who do we need to bring to the table? What are the benefits and potential harms of defining ultra-rare? Because if we're going to start having real in-depth conversations on the incentives that we want to put in place to help ensure ultra-rare disease therapy development, we need, first need to have a, a better idea of how to define ultra-rare. And so we want to make sure we're doing that in a science-driven approach, evidence-driven approach that has the right stakeholders. And so what this, again, this uh, request will do is we'll put in report language, which I'll talk a little more in the deep dive what exactly that is, uh, to begin that process and make sure we bring all stakeholders together to really have a better understanding of what is, is ultra-rare and how can we in better support those communities to incentivize the development of therapies uh, for those communities. Uh, and so thank you again all for being here. Again, we'll go into this much more uh, in a couple of sessions from now. And uh, thank you again. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Dave Zook with Figri Drinker, and it's a privilege to be here with all of you and um, talk about another one of these cross-cutting priorities, the Benefit Act. But before doing so, I uh, just want to commend Every Life and all of you for being here. I've been working in and with Congress since the mid-1980s. And as Nick noted, there are a lot of ups and downs, ebbs and flows, uh, different challenges across that time. But the one constant really has been uh, Congress responding to your needs. And it's because of your advocacy, your engagement, your partnering with offices like the ones represented here who are real leaders uh, in these efforts. And whether it's funding, appropriations, other legislation, FDA reform, the STAT Act, and what I'm going to be speaking to, the Benefit Act, uh, it's the partnerships that you all are building that really drive this change. Uh, so very exciting, very, uh, very, really illuminating to be here today. Uh, and I hope to shed some light on the Benefit Act. Those of you that have been uh, part of this effort for some time will recognize that this is 
um, a repeat uh, in, and uh, we're determined that 2023 is the year uh, for uh, getting this across the goal line. I'll talk a little bit about uh, some of the, the challenges to that, but uh, of course, once again, like STAT, uh, BENEFIT is an acronym. Uh, wouldn't be Washington if we didn't have an a, a number of acronyms uh, to share with you all. This one is a little harder than STAT, I think. Uh, <laughs> I should actually quiz the panel to see if, if they... So it's better empowerment uh, new to enhance framework and improve treatments act of 2023 20, forget that benefit act uh, benefit act is is the name of it that's what it's known as uh, among many of uh, our colleagues and those who have been advocating for it now I want to uh, talk about what it is why uh, this is important and what we're going to try to do of course in the advocacy uh, context so Specifically, what the Benefit Act would do is it's legislation that would require the FDA to disclose how they use patient experience data in their reviews. So I'm going to unpack that a little bit. That's kind of wonky. Uh, but uh, the uh, number of years ago, uh, the concept of patient-focused drug development through work on the committees in Congress in partnership with uh, the FDA and stakeholders like yourself started to develop a new paradigm really for designing clinical trials and conducting them and uh, evaluating them at the FDA called patient-focused drug development. Many of you I'm sure are familiar with that term and how that's been uh, taking shape now for over a decade. But at the center of that notion is, of course, understanding the patient perspective on the disease, on the treatments, on the changes that you want, really uh, boiling that down and understanding it, and then bringing that into that very complex process of drug development and, and drug review. And it sounds sort of obvious. Why wouldn't that be the case? Why wouldn't we have the patient and caregiver perspective really at the center. Well, traditionally that's not how science has worked, uh, but increasingly it is, and it's through the work that many of you have led that Congress has really advanced in patient-focused drug development. Um, so companies, advocacy groups, regulators are aligning around this idea and making sure that patient experience data is is being developed, and that takes a lot of different forms, those perspectives on the disease, on the care, on the new treatments. Um, and so one of the things uh, Congress has done is also uh, really two steps in the 21st Century Cures Act that are very important to this story leading to benefit. One is uh, they uh, required the FDA to create guidances. That's how FDA talks to industry about how they should pursue specific drug development projects. And four guidances are now being developed as a result of that act, which will really lay out how the patient experience data is collected, how it's analyzed, how it's applied in clinical trials, how it's used by the agency for regulatory decision making. Um, so that's a very important process. We're through two of them, a third draft going to final, and the fourth one, that's how the regulators will use this information, is there's been a workshop and that's forthcoming. So they're on track, I think, with the requirements in the uh, 21st Century Cures Act. The other element of that bill, which in, actually in the same section around patient-focused drug development, in addition to the guidances, was something called the Patient-Focused Impact Assessment. Act. It was incorporated into 21st Century Cures, and that requires that when a new therapy is approved, like we had a rare disease therapy approved yesterday on Rare Disease Day, that deserves a round of applause. <laughs> uh, uh, amazing. I hope they do that on every Rare Disease Day now, uh, and more, many more days, but uh, really exciting development. Uh, and the... Uh, uh, PFIA, as we call it, Patient-Focused Impact Assessment, requires that in those packages, those approval packages now, FDA says whether or not patient experience data was submitted. That's it. 
It's an important advance. We knew that, and we worked with Congress, that uh, because these investments were being made, we, we wanted to be able to track that. We wanted some transparency around it. So that was incorporated. Congress included that. It's happening now. You can track that. We do uh, every year take a look at uh, what uh, approvals included patient experience data. And it's important to see that trend. More and more uh, projects are including it importantly to help inform decision making uh, and uh, what are the risks that folks are willing to take for a new therapy. How do those balance with the benefits? Questions of that nature. Um, so uh, benefit now is really the next step, I think, is how we uh, think about it. Yes, indeed. Uh, with, with the uh, beyond that, in that transparency process. So we not only want to know that it was submitted, but was it used? Sounds obvious. Uh, but again, in terms of transparency and in light of really all the energy, all the investment that's going into it, people's lives are being contributed in many different ways. Their insights their energy uh, and their time and effort. So we want to know how those are used and again, be able to track that. It's not how one of the, we talked about, you talked about the STAT Act and some of the feedback, you're probably aware of this on the, on the Benefit Act too. There was a technical uh, response from the FDA. The new bill has addressed a number of those and thank you very much. Uh, so <laughs> we've, uh, we really, uh, it's just been reintroduced and uh, our leads are, are Congresswoman Matsui, Congressman uh, Winstrip, Senator Wicker, and, and Senator uh, Klobuchar, great champions. We heard some of those names a moment ago, too. Great champions, along with others, for the rare disease community. The bill's just reintroduced, uh, so it's ready for your advocacy, this transparency and knowing when the patient experience data is used and how. The agency does have concern. Uh, we've addressed some of it. They have concern around they don't want to have to uh, unpack a complex decision and w exactly weighting things across uh, individual uh, products and their approvals. So our bill does not do that. It really uh, just requires that uh, we build on uh, whether or not it's used with how it was used. Um, so uh, we're very excited to have this reintroduced and um, look forward to your advocacy to help us get it across the finish line this year. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Um, yes, we're very excited to get the Benefit Act across the finish line as well. Um, Thanks all for being here. It's so great to see you. My name is Jackie again, and I am Congresswoman Matsui's health policy advisor. <clears throat> um, I'll be quick because I know we want to leave time for questions, but my ask is to talk about the Congressional Rare Disease Caucus, um, of which Congresswoman Matsui is the newest co-chair, and I'll just say briefly, you know, she is super thrilled to get the opportunity to work more closely um, with the rare disease community, with Every Life, with the Congressional uh, Caucus co-chairs to really work on rare disease issues. Um, she has a long history, of course, Benefit Act um, is one of her bills. She has many other initiatives and has a long history of working on rare disease issues. Um, she's personally impacted by rare disease with her late husband, Bob Matsui, so she's very kind of deeply entrenched in this community and really um, cares about, about moving these issues forward. Um, so she's really excited about being the newest co-chair. So what is a caucus? Um, so a lot of business in Congress occurs through committees, of course, through votes on the floor. Um, we also have caucuses so that members who are interested in certain issue areas can come together um, discuss kind of what issues are happening on the ground, educate members and staff on kind of technical issues like the bills that we've presented today, right? Um, staff need to understand kind of the technicalities of what's happening at, at FDA or at the NIH um, so that they can bring to their members, you know, here's something that we really need to care about. Um, they're also an opportunity for, you know, legislation to arise and to, to share about legislation. Um, I'll be honest, there's kind of a range of caucuses. There are some that are, are more just kind of like sign your name on the line. We care about this issue, great. 
that's it. Um, the Rare Disease Caucus is not like that. It is a very active uh, place for, for members to be sharing with one another, for staff to be sharing, um, to elevate constituent voices, to think of new solutions. You know, we talked about the letter that was formed of the caucus leads coming together and saying, okay, how can we really tackle this new issue that's coming up, right? So there's a lot of action happening, and we would really love uh, members to join so that they can be part of kind of the, the things that we're bringing to the table and the issues that we're moving forward. Um, we have four briefings a year, so that's something to, to note. So again, the place where we can uh, think of what new topics do we really need to be discussing and, and letting members and staff know about. So last year, I think our briefings focused on um, the reauthorization of user fees at FDA. So essentially, okay, how can we move forward rare disease um, therapy approvals in that in the FDA sense and strengthen those pathways there? Um, we had another briefing about the 40-year anniversary of the Orphan Drug Act and again, how we can um, honor those celebration of those successes while also moving forward um, and strengthening the Orphan Drug Act. The other two briefings escape me, but essentially, oh, newborn screening was one, right? So again, really, really looking at, okay, what are the issues that are most important to the community right now, and um, what information do members know, need to know to be able to act on those issues? And so the Rare Disease Caucus um, provides those kind of briefings four times a year. Um, so that's a really great resource for members and staff, and, and one of your big selling points for why members should join this caucus. Um, the caucus was started in 2010 by former Congressman uh, Fred Upton from Michigan. In 2015, it became uh, bicameral with the Senate as well, so former Senator Orrin Hatch um, and Senator Klobuchar. Now, as we have said multiple times, it's chaired by my boss, uh, Congressman Matt Sui, um, Representative Bill Arrakis, and then Senators Wicker and Klobuchar, so a great team of really committed advocates and uh, members pushing forward on these issues. Um, it has grown, I believe, to 138 members in the House and 28 senators, which is excellent and a lot thanks to your advocacy and your pushing forward your members on uh, joining the caucus and we really appreciate that. Um, we have representation from 40 states, DC and Puerto Rico, I believe, in the House. Um, and actually, do you all have your schedules yet for your meetings tomorrow? You do? Okay, I'm gonna read you the states that we do not have representation in the house. <laughs> and so if you're visiting one of those states, you have a special ask, and that is, we really wanna make sure we have representation from all these states. Obviously, rare disease has no, uh, no state boundaries, so we need all, the, all these members to be part of uh, the caucus. So Hawaii, Alaska, Iowa, Mississippi, Montana, North Dakota, Vermont, West Virginia, Wisconsin, Wyoming, and Montana. Can I have a round of applause? Anyone visiting any of those areas? Okay, okay, all right, great. So special, special um, marching orders for you all, right? So <laughs> let's get some representation from those members. Um, some of the senators are, are on board, but. Um, Great, and then if you do wanna check if your member is already um, a member of the caucus, you can go to rarecaucus.org, so just check a list of the membership there. Um, but even if they are a member, you know, just thank them for being part and for um, continuing to engage with, with these issues. Um, and then just a reminder, you know, this is a great time. It's the beginning of a new Congress. We have 74 new members um, in the House, seven new senators, so great time to ask them and to let them know, hey, here's this really great thing that you can be a part of. It's an awesome caucus, and we want, we want you to um, show that you're caring about the rare disease community and also have this excellent resource for how you can work on this issue. Um, so I believe that's it for the caucus. I think we'll turn it over for questions, but yes. that's all. Great, thank you to our panel so much. <laughs>